Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We are Team 3, my name is Arya, and I'm here with Tiago, Shadar, and Ohm. We are excited to present to you our Pi Game project, Super Ohio Throwdown. Super Ohio Throwdown is an action-packed role-playing game that takes you on a journey through various levels, finding up enemies and bosses based on iconic characters and people along the way. The game is set in a fictional United States, where an evil presence has taken over the land. The main character, Shadar, has been sentenced to 20 years to life for having too much fun. He sets off on a quest to break out of prison using one of his friends, who he contacts with his daily prison call. The player can pick up one of his three friends, LeBron James, Bruce Lee, or Monkey D. Luffy, to help him break out of prison and get revenge on the evil emperor who has taken over the land. Shadar and his fighting friend will venture through the prison, Florida, Detroit, and finally the hellish landscape of Ohio to confront the emperor and reveal his secret identity. To make it to Ohio, Shadar will navigate the landscape and confront enemies that his fighter ally will battle against. After every battle, Shadar can choose to swap his ally with the enemy that he just defeated. Through combat, Shadar's ally can level up. Every enemy is a playable character and each fighter has a unique stat total and move set with over 15 different move effects and dozens of different moves at his disposal. With the right knowledge, the player can help Shadar defeat the Ohio Overlord and clear his name. Let's take a closer look at some gameplay. Right off the bat, you'll notice the startup main menu with a variety of options. Start, exit, controls, and credits. As you can see, the control screen offers a brief explanation as to how to move around in-game and how to interact in the battle screen, and the credits shows our names. Exit and start buttons are pretty straightforward, and once the player clicks the start button, the game begins. First, we have an interactable menu that allows players to select their characters. Once the player selects a starting fighter, players will navigate through an overworld map that leads to various levels. In each level, players will encounter a series of grunt enemies, a mini-boss, and a boss, which provide three different levels of difficulty as well as different levels of experience gain. For example, a grunt enemy will give one level, a mini-boss will give two levels of experience, and a boss will give three levels of experience. To defeat these enemies, players will engage in the battle loop, where they can use a variety of attacks and strategies to emerge victorious. In addition to the battle system, we also have a pause menu that allows players to access their stats, view their moves properties, and quit the game. The game also features a loading system that allows players to progress through multiple levels seamlessly. To start the technical analysis of the code, we'll first take a look at the fighter class, the backbone of Super Ohio Throwdown's combat system. One of our main goals during development was to implement a game mechanic allowing the player to switch fighters with an enemy they defeat in combat, allowing the user a lot of customizability in their gameplay. Super Ohio Throwdown features nine different playable characters, each with unique abilities and strengths. As players progress through the game, they will gain experience points and level up their characters, unlocking new abilities and increasing their stats. Each character is created from a game object called the fighter object. The fighter object is used as the basis for battles, with each character having its own, with many attributes present to allow for a full implementation of our desired battle loop. Right off the bat, you can see that the fighter class accepts 5 arguments when first initialized. As you can see, these arguments are stats, move set, XP total, file name, and name. Stats is a list of four integers unique to each different fighter. It represents the base stats for each fighter's attack, defense, speed, and HP, respectively. The different stat distribution for each fighter gives them all a different playstyle. For the imported stats list, we use a simple level-based formula to calculate their actual stats and store it in the stat attributes. We also create a duplicate temp stat attribute for use in battle. This temp stat allows us to add in battle effects like moves that boost attack or speed temporarily easily without altering the actual fighter stats themselves. The next fighter attribute is moveset. Moveset is a 2D list with multiple variable types inside. Inside each list is another list. Stored inside this moveset list is each move's base power, accuracy, power points, effect ID, 
priority, learn level, and attack name. We will touch on these various properties of moveset later in the presentation. XP total is an integer value that keeps track of the XP points the player receives from battles. It is most often used in the find level and after win methods in the class, which get the fighter level from the total points and adjust the fighter stats from level respectively. Last but not least is a file name argument. This simply accepts a string file path and is used to easily access the sprite wherever a unique fighter object is referenced. Likewise, the name argument takes a string value representing the fighter's in-game name, it is saved to the self.fighterName attribute, and is most prominently referenced in the GUI of the battle screen. Next, we would like to explore the movesets list and their attributes in greater detail. As mentioned earlier, we'd like to break down some more details about the individual elements inside the 2D list moveset. Base power is the relative attack strength of each attack, primarily used in the damage calculation method. Accuracy affects the probability of a move to hit. However, since most moves have 100 accuracy, this mechanic is not often used. To prevent players from spamming the same moves repeatedly, we have implemented a PowerPoint system that limits the number of times each move can be used. If a move runs out of power points, a boolean trigger is set off in the fighter object representing the player, causing the move to deal zero damage and have no effects going forward. This encourages players to strategize and use a variety of moves in battle and allows for greater game balance. Effect ID is an integer value used in the battle loop to determine if a move has any non-damage dealing based effects. When it comes time to deal an attack, non-zero effect IDs will either have an effect before after or before and after the attack. Some battle effects can be as simple as raising your attack by one stage, which in this game is 50%, or as complicated as dealing 6.25% extra chip damage per turn or blocking an enemy attack for zero damage. We will touch more on battle effects later in the presentation. Priority is a move property and integer value crucial to the speed calculation in battles. Normally, the faster fighter will attack first, or either fighter has a 50% chance of moving first if there's a speed tie. However, certain moves have an increased priority, which overrides speed if one fighter's attack priority is greater. This allows for greater depth to the battle system, as certain fighters who have lower speed to balance greater attack can move first if they have access to higher priority moves. The learn level property was not utilized in the final build as we focused development time on more impactful features. If implemented, the game would provide a move learn prompt at a certain level up, allowing the user to swap out an old move for a new one. Finally, attack name is a string value that allows us to display the attack name in the battle screen. We'd like to continue by talking about the various loops in the main method that form the game itself. To start, we'll discuss the overworld loop. The player begins the game in the overworld, which allows them to move around using the arrow keys to orient themselves around the level. In the level 1, 2, 3, and 4 files, the level's textures are selected and a player object is created, allowing the user to move and interact with the level. The level's tile maps are found in the level settings file. In the overworld, the player can begin combat by colliding with the enemy sprite starting the battle loop, accessing the me pause menu with the escape key, or moving onto the next level by colliding with the escape vehicle. In some levels, the next level cannot be accessed until the boss has been defeated. On the coding end, many things occur every cycle of the overworld loop. First, the loop evaluates which boolean level trigger is active and creates the enemies for the level, scales the XP levels to the players, and displays the next story message if necessary. When the level method is called, the player object is accessed through the player.update method, which allows for the user to move the player character through the level during the loop. The event handler in the main also allows for the program to be exited through the window X button and for the pause menu to be accessed. When the player enters combat with an enemy in the overworld, the battle loop begins. Once the loop has been triggered, the game will blit the battle GUI on screen, including the player fighters, moves, and power points remaining, player name and level, HP and XP remaining, and enemy name and level. An event loop is created to allow the game to update when the player clicks on an attack. Once the player has selected their attack, the opponent's fighter's attack is chosen at random. First, the speed calculation is processed between the player's fighter and the enemy. If a fighter has a higher priority move, that fighter attacks first that turn. If there's a priority tie, the fighter with a greater speed stat moves first. 
If both priority and speed stats are equal, a random number is generated, either a 1 or a 2. This coin flip determines whether the player or enemy moves first. At this time, the player and enemy lose 1 PP for the move chosen. After speed calculation is done, a boolean is returned to select the appropriate attack order in the code. If a hero or enemy attack has no PP remaining, the attack has no effect and deals 0 damage. Otherwise, the before attack effect, damage, and after attack effect are evaluated and executed if appropriate for the attack chosen. Once both attacks have been fully processed by the system, the attacks and damage dealt are blitted to the screen. Afterwards, the HP bar changes and new fighter battle HP are blitted to reflect the turn's progress. From this point, the loop has three different outcomes depending on if the user and enemy still have HP remaining, if the enemy has zero or less HP, or if the user has zero or less HP. If neither fighter is out of HP, the loop restarts. If the enemy is out of HP, the player will receive the enemy-specific appropriate XP, and the XP gain animation will play. Afterwards, the battle will end and the player will return to the overworld. If the player's fighter runs out of HP, the end battle condition will evaluate to true, displaying the game over screen and quitting the game thereafter. In all of the game's levels, a player class is sent to the game objects class where the attributes are created such as the input keys, the movement based off those input keys, and collision detection between the player and the many sprites throughout the different levels. This is also where collision between the three different enemy types is evaluated and where the order of the battle is implemented, so that the mini boss must be fought before the boss, and the boss must be defeated before the player can enter the new level. Now I'll talk more in depth about the move and collision methods, starting with move. This method takes in a direction variable that has an x and y factor. For example, x is triggered to 1 or negative 1 if the player is moving horizontally, and y is triggered to 1 or negative 1 if the player is moving vertically. When the player is stationary, the directional trigger will stay at 0. The direction variable is multiplied to a speed variable to compute the player's movements in the appropriate direction at a speed that feels correct for the game. If the player is moving diagonally, a built-in function is used to change the speed variable to the equivalent diagonal speed, making sure that the player moves at the same rate in all directions. Next, I'd like to talk about the collision method. The collision method also uses the x and y variables to find the player's direction of movement, so that if the player moves into a sprite's border, it can trigger a battle for an enemy sprite or stop movement if it hits a barrier tile. When the player collides with a tile, the method ensures that the player's sprite boundary does not exceed the obstacle sprite's boundary in the game world, regardless of the movement speed, which might otherwise lead to a collision error. To wrap up the technical analysis, we'd like to talk about the character swapping method. After winning against a grunt, mini boss, or boss in the game, the char swap function is called. This function takes in two parameters, hero source and enemy source, to initialize the display. The display is created by generating a new screen on top of the current game screen. This new char swap screen showcases both the current hero and enemy images, along with two buttons labeled yes and no. These buttons allow the user to select whether they want to continue with the swap or not. The char swap function enters a loop that keeps redrawing the screen until the user makes a selection. Based on the user's choice, the hero's stats and moves will be updated accordingly with the enemies. This adds an element of unpredictability and excitement to the game where the user can choose to take a step and swap their character with the enemies. Welcome to the pause menu of this exciting game. Here you can take a moment to catch your breath and strategize for the battles ahead. First, let's take a look at your ally stats. You can see their attack, speed, defense, and health stats displayed prominently on the screen, along with their name and level. This will help you understand your ally's strengths and weaknesses in battle, as well as their current progress. Next, let's take a look at your ally's moves. You can see four moves listed on the screen, and by clicking on each move, you can view the detailed stats for that move. This will help you choose the best move for the situation at hand. For example, you might see that one move has a high attack stat, while another move may not have an attack stat, but instead inflict a status effect. Understanding the stats of each move can help you make strategic decisions in battle. Once you have a chance to review your ally's stats and moves, you have two options. You can continue the game by selecting continue, 
or you can quit the game by selecting quit. Remember, taking a moment to pause and strategize can be a difference between victory and defeat. Overall, Super Ohio Throwdown offers an engaging gameplay experience with its combination of an overworld map, battle loop, leveling system, and multiple levels with varying enemies and bosses. We hope you enjoyed playing our game as much as we enjoyed creating it. Thank you for your time.